Welcome, everyone. It's uh, it's a little past one, so we will begin the showcase as uh, as one of our guests are joining us online. Um, I'd like just to to quickly let you know that uh, we are recording the showcase, and we will share a link uh, to those who who are interested uh, as soon as it's um, uh, put up on our uh, Geoscience Australia YouTube channel. Uh, if you would like to receive the recording, please let us know via the contact details in your Eventbrite email or contact uh, uh, details that we'll uh, display at the end of this showcase. Welcome uh, to all of you, uh, our guests from Australia uh, and, and around the globe. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands and waters uh, that we meet across. Uh, we acknowledge the elders past, present and future and respectfully appreciate that the lands and waters of Australia have always been uh, and remain the custodial lands and waters of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. It's upon their ancestral lands that Geoscience Australia is located as we share our own knowledge, learning, research practices uh, within Australia. We uh, also pay respect to the knowledge and tradition of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people. My name's Trent, and I will be your moderator for today. Alicia sends her apologies. Uh, she's uh, unfortunately uh, um, indisposed thanks to a dental emergency. So uh, for those of you who have joined us uh, at our previous showcase, it's wonderful to have you uh, here with us again. Uh, and for those of you joining for the first time, it's my pleasure to welcome you for the final DEA showcase of 2020. Despite continuing to not be able to welcome any of you uh, to the Geoscience Australia building for a showcase, uh, it's really fantastic to be uh, here and have the opportunity to share our program updates with a much wider audience uh, wherever you happen to be. Uh, so just a few housekeeping items before we kick into it. Um, because we have so many people uh, joining us, uh, we will be muting participants uh, as to uh, not interrupt the presenters too much. Uh, I ask you to ensure that your microphone remains muted throughout the showcase. Um, that said, we want this to be a chance for everyone to engage with us and ask questions. So uh, following the presentation, uh, we will we'll be taking questions via the Zoom chat window only. Uh, so uh, as the presentations are going, um, please, uh, please add your questions, your comments to the chat. and We'll, uh, we'll go through them. Uh, in case you don't know how to use the chat, it's at the bottom of uh, your Zoom window, uh, you should see an icon that looks like a speech bubble. Click on that, uh, open up the chat and you can type your questions there. Please note that uh, your questions and comments will be visible uh, to everyone uh, who is here today. We have four speakers across three presentations today uh, who will be talking about the work we're undertaking with Australian government and industry and how we go about planning uh, and ultimately delivering uh, on our um, objectives in the Digital Earth Australia program. Uh, so our first presenter will be Belle Tissett. She's an Assistant Director for Product Delivery uh, in Digital Earth Australia, and she will be giving us all an update on uh, the DEA land cover product, which I know many of you are uh, very, very keen to see. Uh, secondly, there will be a co-presentation uh, from Olivia Sackett and uh, David Gavin. Olivia is AI Assurance Lead from Ernst & Young, and she is um, uh, leading the, uh, the efforts around uh, the EY Next Wave Data Science Challenge. David Gavin is Director for DEA Technologies. And then finally, we will be having a presentation from uh, Dr. Mark Broomhall. Uh, he has an official title here. I call him the drone guy, uh, but he is also known as the assistant director uh, for earth calibration and validation, as well as being GA's chief remote pilot. So without further ado, let's get into it. And at this point, I'll hand over to Belle uh, to, uh, to kick us off with her presentation on DEA land cover. Hi everyone, thanks Trent. Um, we're just going to the next slide straight away, thanks. Um, today I want to talk a little bit about our ongoing land cover project and how above all it's really a story of um, successful collaboration. I'll go over a bit about what the project is, the journey we've had so far and the successes we've had 
where we're at and um, what's coming next. But the key messages that I really wanted to share is about the value that we've gained from working closely with um, all the stakeholders that you see and partners here, CSIRO, ABS, um, DOOR, UNSW and Aberystwyth. Um, what we set out here to create was not, it was certainly not an easy task. And we wanted to create a reliable, standardised, continental scale mapping of Australia's land cover and how it changes over time that can be used by other agencies, industry and the public. Um, these land cover maps and change maps will be both historical, so going back the 30 years of our satellite imagery archive, as well as current and able to be run as the required data becomes available for a given year. This will enable users to understand more about not just the current state of our environment, but also how it's changed over the past 30 years. The product we're creating, if I do say so myself, is groundbreaking. Um, it will provide valuable insights into Australia's ever-changing environment, but I have no doubt that it wouldn't be where it is today without the incredible work of all the groups that you see listed here. We've had regular workshops, feedback, um, ongoing consultations, and the shared understanding of the challenges of this project um, to build um, empathy of you know, an understanding when things don't go to plan or um, deadlines aren't quite um, as we expected. The, um, being able to do this together as a group has made it what it is today and has enabled the ongoing improvements that I'll share in the following slides. Uh, next slide. So what you see here, our journey started with the Food and Agriculture Organization's Land Cover Classification System Taxonomy. Oh, that's a mouthful. Um, I can never say it well, it doesn't matter how many times I do this. Essentially what this is, is a way of breaking the landscape into categories. So the diagram shown here depicts a small portion of the um, FAO's taxonomy. And this is the part that we're implementing for our version one of our land cover product. I won't go too in depth into this, but the idea is that we look at every pixel across all of Australia and we determine which land cover class it belongs to. So the top section, the colorful bit, is a series of binary decisions. So we decide, is it vegetated or not? Is it wet or not? Is it natural or not? And at the base of this, we have the um, classes with the stars on them um, are our six major land cover types. And we call this our level three classification. I mentioned this because I, in my future slides, they're labeled as level three. So that's what I mean when I say that is these six classes. Um, the second phase of it, level four, each of these classes is further refined by including attributes such as life form, canopy cover and water persistence and so on to give us a much more detailed picture of the environment. Next slide, please. So just a quick summary of these six uh, base land cover classes. Uh, we have from the top left, we have um, cultivated terrestrial vegetation, natural terrestrial vegetation, natural aquatic vegetation, so mangroves and things, um, artificial surfaces, so um, urban areas, naturally bare surfaces, which is a predominantly bare class. There's not much of Australia's surface which will be entirely bare. You get, but um, if it's predominantly bare area, and we also look in those areas in particular, we also look at um, what percentage has uh, vegetation cover as well, so that we're um, seeing even with the smaller amounts of vegetation, we'll measure that in those pixels too. And then we have a, a predominantly water class. Uh, next slide, please. So, and apologies for this color scheme. Um, <laughs> the first step was to build a system which could load the products from Digital Earth Australia, create the required input layers to construct our classified maps. And in October last year, we were able to create our first continental maps that you see here. If you can ignore the rather intense color scheme and it's lower resolution than what we're aiming for, this was a huge step for us. Um, the processing under the hook was working. We could um, go through all of the tiles in Australia, pick a year and um, produce these land cover maps. And now the focus needed to just go on to improving those input layers to, to get a better classification. Next slide, please.
So December last year, um, just a few months later, we had a lovely new colour scheme, which can't be understated. Um, and we had a new processing workflow in AWS so we could produce um, much higher resolution maps and we could, uh, and better looking at, in my opinion. So a quick assessment of this one though, if you recall the colors that I showed earlier, you can see um, the, the pinkish kind of color is the artificial surfaces, so urban areas. And we can clearly see we've got some issues through the center of Australia with cities that don't really exist. And we've also got much more bare area, the brown color than what we should for Australia. So next slide, please. Um, so the next version of this, April this year, and um, we reworked the urban layer and the veg not veg layer. Um, it's looking significantly better. We can see that it's cleaned up a lot of the urban misclassification, um, circled in red. You can see there's still a significant desert city um, in central Australia. And um, whilst we have more veg vegetation coming in across the continent, we have, you can see um, in the yellow circle, you can see that um, we're getting vegetation coming up in um, what is a dry salt pan. And we're also getting, uh, we've lost the wheat belt in Western Australia and it's, turned, it's gone to a bear class. So this particular um, version was our beta version that we ran and delivered to our stakeholders for review and feedback. And that process was super valuable in um, understanding, you know, where they saw the major issues being. We can highlight things that we see, but the, the collaboration and the discussions that followed from that was really valuable in, our, in us producing um, the next iteration of our maps. Uh, next slide, please. So we have October. Um, we were able to integrate the stakeholder feedback from that beta release. And this one is looking pretty great, I think. Um, it's got significantly better veg coverage. You can see that the wheat belt in um, Western Australia is now coming up as cultivated vegetation, that pale green. And the, the giant desert cities are all gone. The dry salt pans aren't coming up as vegetation anymore. It's looking pretty good. The two arrows that you see in purple um, are pointing to, I'm not sure how well you can see it on your screens, but there are some lingering incorrect urban classifications there. So fast forward to our hot off the press. Next slide, sorry. Um, this is our most recent map produced earlier this month. And it's very much the same as the October um, one that we did. However, the pesky little urban areas have all been cleaned up. And um, this is the version one of this product that we will be uh, delivering to ABS um, for work into the land accounts that they're working on. So, from a far away, I mean, you can get the general idea of it, um, but close up, had, um, you're able to see a lot more of the details. So next slide, please. Just a nice close up of, an, of a cultivated area. You can see, um, you know, the outlines of individual um, cropping areas. You can see the details um, of the, the river as it runs down and weaves around through that natural vegetated area. Um, to the bottom right, there's a small town that you can see highlighted. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of um, detail on these maps that's fantastic. Um, next slide, please. So whilst all the maps I've been showing uh, up to now have been our level three classification, we also run the whole continent at level four. It's just because of the level of detail, it is a little bit harder. Um, when you're staring at the whole map to, to figure out what you're looking at. But um, they're great for isolating individual features when you're focusing in. So this slide is just to show some of the additional detail that you get from those um, level four layers, um, adding in uh, canopy cover percentages and um, life forms. So whether it's woody or not woody, 
and around the edges of the water, you can see we've got a water persistence as well, which changes the um, the cut. We've got the, why we've got the two tones of blue in there. Um, next slide, please. So, how accurate is the map? Um, that's exactly what we're working on right now. So, we have um, six thousand points across Australia that are our uh, validation points. These have been um, stratified to ensure that we have um, adequate validation points created for each class. And the right hand image shows these points grouped into clusters of 100 or so, which um, we're currently uh, painstakingly working our way through manually validating each of these points. So we have uh, 6,000 points for both 2010 and 2015, which are the two maps that we've currently produced. And not only will this provide an accuracy measure of um, for this for our current product, but these 12,000 manually classified points um, could also be a val valuable resource for others to use. And once this validation effort's done, we'd really like to um, look into the best place to store this information and how to share it and what other people would um, like to do. It's, if you're interested in this data, I'd love to hear from you. Um, let us know. Uh, next slide, please. So what's next? Finalise the validation. Hope that we all don't go insane validating a lot of points. Um, so that's the primary focus right now. I get through that validation. We expect to deliver the 2010 and 2015 version one product to ABS early December, which is just a release um, for the land and ecosystem account planning team to um, for use in the land accounts. And after this preliminary release for that particular purpose, our focus will be on preparing for an operational production and public release. Um, as we're going through an upgrade here in DEA of our imagery collection, there's going to be a body of work early next year to port our code over to the new, um, new collection. And then once we have it all running on the, the new data collection, we press the big green button and pump out 30 years of land cover maps for everybody to enjoy. Um, thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed this. Um, any questions? Oh, I right. can see thanks, the chat. Thanks, thanks a lot, Belle. Um, I might just start by asking, do you actually have a big green go button? Oh, I don't, but I could totally make one with my Arduino. Yeah, I think that's- It a might be plan. worth it. Hey, this is my summer holiday plan. Now. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Great. Thanks, Bell. Uh, there are a few questions that, that have uh, come up in the chat, so I might just uh, run through them. Uh, you may have covered this, but um, uh, what is the pixel size of the um, of the land cover map? Oh, okay. I did, totally didn't. Um, the so the current land cover maps that we do are doing are based on Landsat, so that we can go back for that thirty year period. So they're twenty five meter pixels for the current one. New collection, they'll be thirty meter pixels. Mm. So when we release, they'll be thirty meter pixels. Sorry. And in terms of uh, comparison to the uh, the uh, previous methods we had for uh, our land cover mapping, uh, what's our the current published land cover map is two hundred and fifty meter pixels. So a big step forward. So a huge step forward and the level of detail that you can get on this is phenomenal. It's really yeah. exciting. Thanks, Belle. Uh, another question here. Is the land cover classification monthly, seasonal or annual? Um, it's an annual product. So we'll have one for each year. Gotcha. Uh, and uh, what are you using for training? training. Um, it depends on what you mean by training. So, uh, to create the classification, it's not a machine learned model. It's a whole heap of individual binary layers that go in. So um, we do have a few different train models that go in for say the urban layer and um, the cultivated layer that go in. Mm -hmm. um, the others are based on products that come out of our um, out of Digital Earth Australia, existing products that are in Digital Earth Australia. Um, as far as training for the cultivated one, we collected a whole heap of training data, manually highlighted bits, and then um, 
fabulous team member um, cleans them and um, trained his model based on that. Mm. Um, the urban one, I would need to refer you to the um, a different team that did the urban stuff for us <laughs> rather than making it up and getting it totally wrong. <laughs> oh, it's always more fun if you make it up, is it not, Bill? <laughs> I mean, I could. <laughs> So, uh, so a couple of comments as well, suggesting that uh, that validation map uh, looked great. It looked like Indigenous art. So. Oh, I thought so too. It okay, was yeah. um, night off week and we were like, oh, wow, it looks just like the, <laughs> <laughs> it was perfect. Fantastic. And, uh, and fin finally, uh, all, a couple of questions here that have, another one's just popped in. Uh, is this field validation or some other sort of validation? This is some other sort of validation. This involves us um, looking at the pixel and going through all of the imagery that we have for that year and determining what um, we would class it, which class we would put the um, pixel into because we're classifying 2015 and 2010 across Australia. We don't have um, consistent data that we can validate against. It would be amazing if we had actual <laughs> um, ground truth stuff, but that's not available to us at the moment. Mm. And uh, there's one more question here, and then I think we'll we'll call it. Uh, in terms of annual uh, versus seasonal, are you basically doing a dry season image or actually using the full time series? We're using the time series for each year. Great. Excellent. Thanks, Belle. Uh, one of the things I really love about the approach that we're taking um, in terms of land cover is, is that it is uh, taking a building blocks approach where we are we're continually trying to grow the, uh, the level of understanding and knowledge uh, that we have, um, but also we're doing it in a way that means that other people can potentially uh, take their, uh, their own uh, knowledge about a particular uh, part of Australia and potentially take further steps in terms of the classification. So in terms of making sure that when we are producing some of the products that we do, that we do it in a, a collaborative way, I think the model that, uh, that uh, you and your team has taken uh, on this bell is is spot on uh, in that it really really does drive that collaborative spirit that we're trying to uh, trying to push. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Bell. Thank you. For that. Uh, and now we we might move on to the next presentation. Uh, so I will hand over to uh, Dave. Dave, you want to kick us off? Uh, sure. And, and I, will, uh, I would like to introduce Olivia Sacker, uh, who, who will be doing the first part of our presentation. Take it away, Olivia. Thanks, Trent. Thanks, David. Um, as Trent said earlier, my name is Olivia Sackett and I am the AI Assurance Lead for EY in Oceania. A lot of people think about accounting when they think about EY, but we're not just accounting. We also have a large data science practice, um, which covers both the consulting and the assurance side of data science. So I'm part of a team that delivers EY's next wave data science challenge. The data science challenge is a hackathon style event that we hold each year and we pitch it to a global audience. Um, and the intention is to help to promote and to grow data science skills in the community. Um, this year, we've been working with Geoscience Australia to design and deliver the 2020 challenge. Um, and during this presentation, we're going to give you a bit of a sneak peek of what's to come. Um, with some more announcements to be made uh, later this month. Next slide, please. So what's the purpose of EY delivering a hackathon like this? Um, so EY's purpose is to deliver long-term value to people, to society and to clients. And the Data Science Challenge is helping us to do this in a couple of different ways. The first being that we're tackling problems of global significance. So you can see there the last three years of data science challenges, including this year, um, where we're looking at employment drivers and quality of life in 2018. 2019, we looked at mobility and smart cities. And this year, we're going to be looking at bushfire response. The second way that uh, this helps us to realise our purpose is that it's helping us to invest in the future workforce. So last year in the Mobility Challenge, we had over 4,500 university students across 15 different countries. Um, we awarded more than 20 internships um, and we awarded more than $30,000 in cash prizes. Um, and so this year we're going to be focusing on bushfire, as I said, and we've been working with the Country Fire Authority 
here in Victoria to understand what are some of the challenges that they are facing as an organisation and how might we use data science to help them. So the, the key challenge that we've been focusing on is um, providing them with some better geospatial information, which they can use to help them answer questions such as who do they warn, where do they send resources and potentially which towns need to be evacuated during the bushfire season. Next slide, please. So in response to that need that's been outlined from the Country Fire Authority, we've designed two related challenges. In the first challenge, we're going to be giving students a set of infrared line scan images that have been provided to us by the Country Fire Authority and Forest Fire Management Victoria. And essentially students are going to be asked to detect fire in these images. The current process for detecting fire in the line scan images is quite time consuming and laborious. And so we hope to provide an automated process that will help to streamline the provision of fire maps based on these line scan images. Now, because we're trying to cater for a range of skills and experience in the student community, we're also asking students to take part in a second challenge, which is potentially for the more advanced students. And within that uh, challenge, they're going to be using fire maps that they create from the infrared images and also from satellite images and the purpose of that challenge is to basically predict the next fire perimeter within that sequence of satellite and airborne images. Next slide, please. So this is a pretty ambitious challenge. Um, and this year we're hoping to attract upwards of 10,000 participants from across um, the globe. So more than 20 countries and um, in order to deliver a challenge of this scale, you know, it's not an EY only event. We've been collaborating really closely with a number of different organisations, of course, including Digital Earth Australia. And I just wanted to take this chance to thank those collaborators, including uh, CFA, Forest Fire Management Victoria, who we mentioned before, but also we're receiving support from Microsoft and from CEOS as well. Um, and as part of the uh, preparation for this challenge, we have run a private challenge um, with some participants from across these organisations. And we've put together a short video to capture some of their experiences. Um, so as I said, watch out for announcements later this month about the launch date for the, the public version of the challenge. Um, and I'd just like to hand over now uh, to David um, and before David speaks to, to play this video. Thank you very much. A very exciting yet challenging uh, experience for us because this is our first time uh, leveraging Python library for uh, image processing. Just graduated from college a year back and this is my first proper job. Uh, just kind of, you know, kind of dipping my toes in, so to speak. But um, yeah, it's been uh, quite interesting. It's a little out of my wheelhouse um, because I don't really have experience in geospatial data or anything like that. But, um, you know, I do have the background in Python, so I think that kind of made things a little easier. I'm finding the challenge interesting and challenging because I've only just started on this journey um, within Jupyter, Python and Azure. Um, so I wanted to increase my knowledge in bushfire and data acquisition. And this came along at the right place in the right time. We have also been able to explore techniques like um, removing noises for the image, adjusting the brightness, smoothing the image to get the best result. So from, from my perspective, I believe it's just a bit of programming. And then also you just have to have a lot of understanding about the topic. How to code in Jupyter um, and using Python a little bit more than I have in the past. What I learn another thing from this challenge is um yeah better to have a part have a teammate. <laughs>
don't give up is very important. Something good to be a part of. Uh, just even if you don't end up you know, uh, finishing or doing really well, you end up picking up picking up some useful skills along the way. So uh, when we were approached by Ernst & Young in June of this year with the initial go live date of October, the initial conversation was basically, hey, we love your data, we love your notebooks, and we love your sandbox platform. How would you feel about us inviting 10,000 students from across the world to, uh, to it to work on a challenge focused on bushfires. And you know, in a year where we're balancing uh, staff turnover, COVID-19 complications and supporting development across two programs of work, our initial response was a nearly resounding, look, thanks, but no thanks. What ultimately convinced us to commit to supporting this event was the opportunities this event presented for Digital Earth Australia, Digital Earth Africa, and the Open Data Cube. Ernst & Young were offering to bring a scale of users to the Open Data Cube and Digital Earth Australia uh, that we simply had not managed to reach by ourselves all in a single event. This would drive our core mandate of promoting the awareness and use of EO data to influence decision making. It would explore, expose more users and young minds to the Open Data Cube. And we wanted to better understand the limits of our own infrastructure. If we cannot support 10,000 users at once, how many can we support? How do, who and how many users should we be aiming to support in a platform like digi the Digital Earth Australia Sandbox? How do we support everybody else that can't or doesn't get access to it or wants to use features outside of it? What's followed since uh, the first meeting with Olivia uh, has been a shared journey of lunchtime meetings, out of office, uh, out of office time work, uh, as the coordinators from EY, Microsoft, CFA, and DEA have basically made this happen in our spare time. It has resulted in some minor extensions to the open data cube. It has grown our awareness and understanding of the Azure platform tremendously and has opened some exciting avenues for next year as we explore what public cloud offerings can help, how public cloud offerings can help drive value into the hands of our users. Finally, we hope that it also lays the groundwork for future challenges for both Australia and Africa and future partnerships with Ernst & Young and Azure. Right, thank you, Dave, and thank you, Olivia. That was a that was a great presentation. Uh, I'll remind everyone if you do have any questions about this, please add them to the chat. Um, I might just uh, say a few words on this while we while we uh, wait for the chat to uh, to catch up. Um, what an amazing opportunity to uh, to put um, Australia into the minds of students from across the globe. Uh, you know, the the idea that uh, that there will be um, uh, a whole bunch of smart people from across the world who who are putting their eye to a real real problem that needs to be solved in Australia is extremely exciting uh, to me, and it's it's a fantastic opportunity for for uh, for DEA, but also for Australia uh, in, in general to uh, to be the focal point for such a um, a significant number of. Um, uh, students from across the globe. So thank you very much to um, to Olivia, to uh, to Ernst and Young for the the fantastic um, opportunity that you have presented us here. Um, there is a question here: Is there information available about the challenge that I can send out to potential students? I might pass that one to you, Olivia. Thanks, Trent, and thanks both um, David and Trent for your your kind encouraging words there. Um, yes, we will be promoting the challenge. Uh, some announcements will be made in the next um, couple of weeks, and I believe we'll be working with the, uh, the marketing team at Geoscience Australia to make sure that everybody has the appropriate information in order to uh, encourage students, as many as possible, to sign up. Great. Thank you, Olivia. And... Uh... Uh, so there's another question here, just asking about the, the timeline for the actual challenge, Olivia. Yeah, that's an important question. Um, what we found with the, a global event as opposed to a regional event is that um, there's not really any good time of the year to run an event. You know, somebody's always having, having an exam somewhere in the world. Um, in order to uh, solve this problem, we've opened the event up this year for up to 12 weeks. And we anticipate that people will probably not take part for the entire 12 weeks, but will find a window of opportunity within that time frame to take part. 
Fantastic. And uh, just just for everybody's information, when we uh, send out uh, the uh, link later on to our YouTube video, we'll make sure we provide some information on uh, on the next web challenge as well. So so that you know how how you can engage or, or in, uh, go about encouraging uh, other people to engage as well. Great. Well, thank you very much again, Olivia, for taking the time to, to present. And thanks. Thanks, Dave, as well. Uh, Okay, on to our final presentation from uh, the drone guy. Uh, Mark, over to you. Uh, thanks, Trent. Okay, so um, just to have a bit of background, this is a Geoscience Australia's um, a remotely piloted aircraft fleet. Uh, so the Mavic Mini, uh, which weighs 249 grams, uh, actually belongs to um, CalVal and um, we mainly use this for practice, but uh, because they've um, changed the rules uh, recently, uh, this um, drone is now in the mini category, uh, sorry, micro category. So we can actually fly this at GA, which um, we took the opportunity to do the other day um, because we've never been able to do that before. Uh, next, please. Uh, so there's three of these in the building. Um, this is the Mavic Pro 2, which weighs 907 grams. And just for some pers perspective, this one's mine. So you can see it's sort of, you know, a bit bigger than my head. And just for perspective, people have told me I have a big head. So uh, that'll give you some idea how big that one is. Uh, next, please. So this is a Phantom. There's two of these in the in the building, uh, and that's uh, about 1.38 kilograms. So <clears throat> um, these smaller uh, drones uh, can be flown without a pilot's license. Uh, so anything over about two kilos, you need uh, a pilot's license. Next, please. Uh, so this is uh, the drone we own at the moment. Um, it's um, 9.5 kilos and it has a maximum takeoff weight of 15.5 kilograms, which means we can put six kilograms of, of equipment on it. Um, unfortunately, that's not uh, big enough for what we want to do. So next, please. Uh, we are in the um, final stages of, this is in the final stages of uh, manufacture. Um, we're hoping to have this um, ship by the end of the month. And this is the NOAA, which um, weighs 13.1 kilos with some retractable landing gear, and that has a maximum takeoff weight of 36.9 kilograms. So um, it has a potential of carrying up to 20 kilograms. Um, and I'll explain why we, um, we've we decided to go with this big drone. Uh, next, please. Uh, so there are some rules around drones. Um, so there are some common rules that if you want to know what they are, you can go to uh, knowyourdrone.gov.au, and this is on the CASA website. Uh, so these rules are applicable whether you're flying um, recreationally or you're flying um, uh, as a business. Uh, and the more specific rules are based on the maximum uh, takeoff weight. So the two biggest drones that we own, which is the M600, which we have now, uh, and the new one that we're getting, they require that we have a remotely piloted aircraft operator certificate or a REOC. Um, so the REOC means you there's a lot of paperwork and a lot of compliance. So you have to keep flight logs and battery logs and pilot logs. Uh, all your pilots have to have uh, remotely piloted licenses. Uh, you need to have a, um, a chief remote pilot who's me, which uh, you're the main uh, contact to CASA. Um, and it's really quite a lot of uh, rigmarole, but so why do we uh, get these big drones and why do we get all this trouble? Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so this is some of the equipment um, that we are putting on the drones. Not all of this goes on the same drone. Um, at the moment, we have a small flame spectrometer, which is around 190 grams. Uh, to that, we also want to add a, an optical switch. So what this does is it allows us to uh, direct uh, sunlight either from uh, downward, downwards from the sun or reflect it off the surface. Uh, we also require a computer, which is a, it's a NUC or a next unit of computing. That's about half a kilogram. Uh, there's a gimbal, which is a thing down the, right down the bottom in the middle. That's about 2.1 2 kilograms. Uh, and there's often batteries and other associated equipment. Um, that has to go on the drone. Uh, so because you've got a, a specific uh, mass that you can carry, um, you have to be very, very careful about what you put on there. So the flame is actually just a Visnir IR spectrometer. So that doesn't actually let us do our entire validation job. Um, so we've had to go and buy a bigger spectrometer. So that's the one down in the bottom right hand corner. So that's four kilograms. So once you have that four kilograms and you have the gimbal, which is two kilograms, we're essentially over the limit of um, what we can carry on our current drone. Uh, next, please. Uh, so this, this is a, 
phase one. So we've actually, um, well, when I say we, it was uh, the other members of the team before I started, they, they conducted a, uh, a national uh, validation campaign. Uh, so this involved uh, CSIRO, uh, GA and university members. Uh, and the spectrometers that we used were uh, the ASD, which is in the top left hand corner there. So that's a full range spectrometer. These are uh, backpack mounted and you can see um, Guy and Eric out in the field. Uh, that was actually last Thursday with these backpack mounted spectrometers. Uh, you also see uh, a top down picture of uh, Guy when he's out at uh, Lake George. So the sites that they chose were, they, they tended to be flat and very homogenous. And the way they sampled them was to uh, actually just walk uh, lines. So you didn't actually sample the entire site. Uh, and because you assumed that they were uh, homogenous, you essentially just scaled that up to um, uh, our test site, which is uh, 100 by 100 metres. So uh, you'll see in the, the, two, the two top images there, so one's sort of an idealised set of lines walked over uh, a um, sort of a Landsat matchup. So you'll see the pixels are a lot bigger. Uh, and I think the GPS didn't work that day, so those lines are actually uh, sort of idealised. Um, and on the right hand side, that's actually one of the Sentinel um, matchups we've done. Uh, and this was done by Guy, who's one of the best in the business. And you can see there that the lines aren't quite that straight because it's quite difficult to operate the instrument and sort of walk in a straight line when you're looking down and up all the time. Uh, on the left hand side, you'll see a, a bunch of uh, graphs. So what you'll see, there's a, there's a raw spectra, uh, which is the the sort of very way we uh, aligns with a with a with kind of a, a big spread, and just below that you'll see uh, sort of much more um, uh, straight lines. They, these are actually uh, our raw spectra that have been convolved with the uh, the satellite bands. So this is what we use to do the comparison to the to the satellites. Uh, and on the bottom. Uh, right hand corner you'll see the matchups between uh, Landsat 8 and Sentinel 2B and also the the spectra that we've captured in the field so you'll you'll see that they're um, they could convolve to the band numbers and you'll see that they we do actually get pretty good fits uh, so what they what we do do with these um, data is we actually the, the field data we um, treat them the same way that the uh, our uh, ARD data is treated so it's atmospherically corrected and it's also corrected for um for BRDF, so this is actually an NBAR product or uh, a normalised BRDF product. Uh, next, please. Uh, so now we move on to our phase two. So this is all to do with drones. Uh, so what a drone allows us to do is we can we can adjust the field of view uh, using a four optic. We can adjust uh, how fast we fly. Uh, we can adjust how high we fly, and that that will give us a, a, a footprint on the ground. So you'll see that little animation up the top there. Uh, that's actually showing uh, an eight degree field of view flying at 30 meters at five meters, 30 meters side at five meters a second. So you'll see we don't actually get uh, complete overlap. So this sort of replicates what we do, what we've done with um, our human based uh, sensing um, program. But what we want to do, uh, if you'll see the, the one below, this is actually uh, essentially the same setup but we're flying at uh, 2.1 meters. Uh, between line spacing and you'll see that covers everything and so the reason why that's important if you look at the uh, the bottom there you'll see a top-down picture of a canopy so if you're subsampling the canopy you can see that there's there's bare spots there's bits of fallen wood and there's shadows so if we were to try and do the same thing that we did um, with our human trials uh, we wouldn't actually get a really good representation um, of, of what's actually on the surface so on the right hand side you'll see um, we've actually We've actually done this uh, once successfully. So you'll see um, uh, above and below where the, the flame is, uh, that's actually the lines uh, as flown by the, uh, by the drone. And you can also see the matchups on the right hand side. Uh, unfortunately with the bottom one, uh, while we were flying that um, 2.1 meter line uh, sampling, the, some cloud came in, so we had to stop. But you'll see we actually get fairly good matchups. Um, except for the last two uh, points on the graph. So they're in the uh, shortwave infrared region, which our uh, flame doesn't cover. So this, this is why we've actually gone and bought a, uh, a full range spectrometer. Uh, next, please. The other thing we can do as well is um, we can actually uh, 
fly the drone in such a pattern as we can actually um, re recreate what's called a, a, a goniometer. So what this actually does is you you can alter the view angle of the of the sensor. So you actually point it at the center of um, of, a, of a pixel, and you can uh, adjust the view angle by flying it around um, in a pattern. So on the bottom right hand side, bottom left hand side, you'll see the the flight path. Uh, and that's actually sort of a series of concentric lines, uh, but at different uh, view angles to the surface. So at all, every time, at all times, the, um, the 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 field of view sensor is actually pointed at the centre of um, of the target. So this allows you to actually measure BRDF. So this gives us a way to um, validate um, what we do with our NBAR correction. So we've actually flown this once with. Um, with, uh, with with this actually, uh, so you can see that um, those two uh, pictures we've taken, one's looking away from the sun, so you get the hot spot, and one's looking towards the sun where you don't actually get the hot spot. So this actually is what's actually replicated in the uh, so the models. Thank you. Uh, so you can see the hot spot. You may as well go to the next one. So anyway, we, we would like to thank the people of the Nambri country who gifted us the new names for our drones. The Nambri ancestors are the custodians of the country southwest of Weewara or Lake George, as most of us know it, which includes modern day ACT. The name of our capital Canberra derives from the ancestral group of the Nagambri people. Uh, the names gifted to, to us by the Nambri for the new drones are Malian, which is our new drone that we're buying, uh, which uh, means Eagle Hawk. Uh, this is a key totem within the Nambri people, along with a crow belonging to the Wogaloo people. The members of the Wogaloo, which are the Nambri and Nurmul, uh, belong within the nation to one of the two classes or sections. The Wogaloo were divided into Eagle Hawk people and Crow people. Uh, Eagle Hawk is another name for witch toad eagle and is the largest Australian bird of prey, which is why we called our large drone um, Malian. Uh, Bujan, which means bird people of the dream time. This is the traditional name used for all native birds from the Canberra's southeast region. Uh, these birds, uh, the eagle in particular, are of great significance to Aboriginal people and the wedge-tailed eagle will be featured on artwork being prepared uh, that will be put on the drones by Nambri elders, Dr. Auntie Matilda House and nephew, Mr. Reuben House. Next slide, please. Any questions? Great, thanks a lot, Mark, for a for a fantastic presentation, and and I'd just like to reiterate my my uh, thanks uh, to the Nambri people as well. We are um, really grateful and and humble uh, by uh, the gifting of these names, and and I can't wait to see the uh, the artwork uh, on the drones either. Uh, very exciting times. So thank you very much. Uh, okay, Mark, there are a couple of questions in here that have come up. Uh, firstly. Uh, are the drones IoT devices um, uh, already associated, plugged into cloud services such as um, uh, MSF Azure IoT or AWS IoT, um, providing uh, images and data in real time? Um, I don't know what any of that stuff means, but no. Uh, Solid no. No. So uh, there's, there's probably no reason why that can't be done at some stage. Um, but the drone, this, these drones here um, are made by a company called DJI uh, and their, their tech is pretty well locked down. Uh, so all the stuff we capture has to be uploaded later on until such time as they change that. But uh, there are other drone manufacturers uh, where there's a lot of open source stuff. So that's probably quite possible to have that uh, all hooked up to uh, internet of everything kind of stuff. Great, thanks, Mark. Uh, and another question here, uh, why do the field reflectance data, um, the red curve in uh, the matchups have larger error bars than Sentinel-2? Uh, well, the error bars are just derived by the, um, the uncertainty from the, the actual data that we capture. So it's just like a, um, uh, um, uh, like a one sigma, two sigma kind of thing. So the, the satellite data is actually less noisy than the field data. So that's probably why the error bars are bigger. Although if you really want to know Rod, go and ask Andrew because he'll he does all that processing. Great. Okay. 
I'm not seeing any other questions coming in. Uh, so I think, oh, hang on. And I just had to say that it's, uh, it's always the way. Uh, so uh, given that you're working with full spectrometers, would you, uh, would your proposed setup be suitable for operational monitoring of active fires? Uh, well, when I say full range, it's full reflected range. So it's, um, it's from say 400 to 2200 nanometers. And while uh, you would pick up a, an active fire at 2200 nanometers, they have to be extremely hot. Uh, so you're better off with a thermal sensor and the, the, it's a much easier setup uh, and you can put it on a much smaller drone and it's much safer. So you can certainly do it, but um, yeah, it's not something we do with our current setup. Mm. Great. Thank you, Mark. Uh, okay. Uh, that, that concludes uh, our final online uh, Digital Earth Australia public showcase for 2020. Uh, we hope you enjoyed it and thank you very much for joining us on Zoom today. Uh, we're always looking uh, to do things better, so we, we would really appreciate uh, your feedback on, uh, on what you've seen uh, here today and, uh, and frankly on, on any other aspect of the program. Uh, if you have any comments uh, 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 or want specifically to make sure you get a copy of the recording, please reach out to us using the, uh, the contact details that you are hopefully seeing on your screen right now. Uh, I'd like to uh, particularly thank our four presenters today and especially uh, our guest, uh, Olivia from EY. Uh, thank you very much, Olivia, for taking the time. Once again, thank you for, for joining us uh, today. Uh, we wish you all the best for the rest of 2020 and look forward to welcome, welcoming you uh, to our next public showcase, which will happen in February next year. Thanks a lot, everyone.